Why don't we go ahead and get started, and we'll try to fix our sound sound issues while we're play, playing some music. So we're going to be talking about the historical Jesus and the resurrection today, which obviously this is where we shift in, in the study we've been doing from really evidences for God for evidence for the God that we believe, the evidence for Christianity, because everything in Christianity hinges obviously on Jesus. Uh, he either rose from the dead and was who he said he was, or our faith is in vain, is what Paul tells us, right? So again, I, I want to start with a, a song. Danny Gokey. Uh, I've not heard that version yeah. before. Like yeah, it's a, Mary, did you know? It's really nice. I like Danny Gokey. He's, mm -hmm. All right, so we'll try to proceed. So here's kind of our schedule. We are... Uh, going to be talking about Jesus, the historical Jesus and the resurrection today. And then next week we'll get into the science that's in the Bible, which will be kind of fun. And then we'll finish up with kind of a recap of everything and how it applies. And what we've been doing is working through our, so we're working through our worldview and we've, we've talked about pretty much everything except science and Jesus. So today we're going to talk about Jesus. This is how we take our worldview from a general worldview. Yeah. We would be talking about Jesus today, so it's not really shocking that the equipment would give us issues. Well, let me see if I can... Maybe I, I should just be quiet until we fix the problem. So, can they hear anything online at all? No, we the whole system. Okay. So the recording's not running either? The local recording's still going? Okay, that's fine. Well, we're waiting. Any questions on the stuff we talked about last week? or Well, and another thing I guess we can talk about, what we're going to do next, if you guys are interested, uh, in after probably the Sunday after Passover, not talking about Easter, talking about Passover, since they're not the same thing this year. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, do you enjoy going to the Philippines when they come back? We're going to do the tactics course from, from uh, Greg Kokel. It's the art of questions. Um, when we've been previewing it, we, we did four of the sessions last night. It was, we, we, we need to learn these skills. So we're going to be doing that on Sunday. So if you guys are interested in participating, they'll probably be kicking off the end of April through, through I don't know. It's, there's eight sessions. I don't know if we'll do two a day or whether we'll do just one one a week so we'll just kind of play it by ear if you, uh, it's like the law of non-contradiction that we did where when you're being challenged by a skeptic or you meet someone even on the street instead of trying to tell them what you believe go into a fact-finding mode first the idea is to learn as much about their position as possible so that you know what to talk about as Christians, we are really quick to try to defend our position and show them the gospel. And that's all great. But if they're not ready for it, you've wasted your breath. And sometimes you actually can do damage. And what Kokel's approach is to, to ask questions and lead to a path where you understand that person. You know, put the rock in the shoe. And then ask questions that, that show that there is a contradiction in their perspective. And basically learning that art of recognizing... The contradiction, and then without getting into <clears throat> without without getting into an argument, maintaining their burden of proof. And he also talks about people can reverse this on you, and he's he's giving you tactics on how to get out of those situations when you're getting overwhelmed by someone that Questions. knows more about the topic than you do, and they're going to take advantage of you and just say, "Okay, tell me what you know," and then I'll let me think, think about, about it, and we'll talk about it another time or something like that. And, it, it's really subtle and it's 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 really powerful. It's very useful. I wish I could learn to use it better myself. Um, and he gives us you know some practical. You know you need to prepare before you have a conversation. Then after you have the conversation, you need to reflect on what you did good and what you wish you'd done different, and then practice what it is that you wish you had done instead of. And it, it was it was a. I mean. I, know, I need the skill myself, so I think we will spend some time, time on that. Actually, Tom is a whole lot better at talking to people about the Lord than I am. Mm -hmm. you know, he's more 
laid back and well that's the key i mean judy joy and i we're kind of like i'm a bloody i'm a bloody your nose okay <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna you know i'm gonna show you that i'm right and it's like being right you can actually be wrong what you're saying might be completely right but your approach and your the way you're presenting it is not a very good reflection on on christ and more importantly you're not winning them you're making them put up defenses and so to do things to try to resist that so that's what we'll be talking about in the future so let me go ahead and open with a prayer and then we'll we'll get into our lesson heavenly father thank you so much for this time today and thank you for you and all the abundance of evidence that shows that not only did you come and sacrifice your life for us but that we can point to so many sources outside of the Bible as evidence to the world that wants to deny you and help us to, to find things that we can, can use when we're in conversations with people that are, are doubting that will encourage them and help them to see that you're real, you're true, and we can trust you. And I pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So again, we've, we're going to... Okay, why did my screen get reversed? It, it is... It, was it like that for a while? Okay. All right, now my machine's going to freak out. It's going to be one of those days, so I, bear with us. We're talking about Jesus, so it shouldn't be really shocking. So again, we're trying to build our worldview. We're going to be concentrating on Jesus, you know, really the evidence for what we believe. And the place that starts the objections that the world has about Jesus. And it starts with, people often say that Jesus grew over time into this myth and legend that we Christians believe. And this is a really common objection. So we need to understand their perspective and then be able to walk through why that's not true. Uh, another is the deity claims. And a lot of people will say that, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. That's something that they invented. They might even blame it on Constantine and the Council of Nicaea, which you will, if you ever watched the Da Vinci Code movie, that's what Ron, Do, Brown, well, I can't remember what his first name Dan. is. Dan Brown, his premise was that Constantine invented the deity of Christ, which is not true. But we need to understand what the evidence is that shows that it's not true. Because people believe this stuff. The crucifixion. There are people that believe the crucifixion never took place. You know, Jesus was never crucified. He was never killed. Why would he be killed? And then obviously the resurrection and people are going to deny that. And that'll be what we end with. That's really the key to what we believe is the resurrection. And the fact that Jesus died is, is, is only evidence that he was a human and he died, but he's not God unless he does what he said he was going to do. And that means the resurrection. So any, any questions before we kind of dig into it? So I'm going to play a short video, what they call the minimum, minimum facts or minimal facts argument. And this is this idea that you can pick four to six of the 15 points that we have as, as evidence for Jesus. And with those minimal facts, you should be able to at least stimulate people to be willing to listen. Okay, so let's listen to this. And I have no sound. Let's try that again. And I have no sound. Oh, this is going to be a, one of those days. Um, oh, well. Sorry. <laughs> All right. We'll t try again. Um, this could be one of those days. All right, the minimal facts argument. The minimal facts approach is a great way to make a case for Christ's resurrection from the dead. Why? These six facts are facts upon which virtually all experts in the field agree. That's significant. Let's take a look at each of these facts. Fact number one is Jesus died by crucifixion. Atheist, liberal, moderate, or conservative scholars agree that Jesus really existed and was executed on a cross. Next comes the fact that Jesus' early followers had experiences a short time later that they thought were appearances of Jesus. 
we'll show you how to respond to those who offer alternative explanations for these appearances. The third fact is that these followers were transformed to the point of being willing to die for this message. People may die for what they believe is true, but not for what they know is false. That's something to think about. Facts 4 and 5 relate to two former skeptics, James and Paul, who became convinced that they had seen the risen Jesus. Not all people who claim to have seen the risen Jesus were initially believers. Something has to account for these conversions. The sixth and final fact notes that this gospel message of the death and resurrection of Jesus began to be taught very soon after these events. And this leaves little room for legends about Jesus to take root, especially since unbelievers were alive to refute outlandish claims. These six facts that virtually all experts in the field accept provide us with solid evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Learn how to make the case for Christ's resurrection and how to reply to skeptics with confidence. Check out our resources on minimalfacts.org. So that's the minimal facts argument. I think it's, the, the power of it is using facts that the majority of people accept and building basically a cumulative case for what we believe. Using things that they, you can kind of walk them through. I mean, this is what everybody believes. And it's like, we gotta support each one of those points though. And the first thing we have to deal with is people deny that Jesus ever really existed or that the fact that he was a myth or a legend. There's plenty of evidence. And let me just share a little bit of that with you. Maybe this is really gonna be one of those days. Okay, so we have a lot of evidence prior to 200 AD. I just picked a line in the sand because this is roughly, you know, less than two centuries from the death of Jesus. These are just the non-Christian sources that are available. You can actually get online and read translated versions of these. It includes Josephus, Tacitus of Rome, another historian. I better pay attention so I can give you the backstories of these. Uh, Tacitus wrote two major works, the Annals and the Histories Examining the Reigns of Emperors Tiberius, Claudius, and Nero, uh, which he called the four, four Caesars or the Four Emperors. And he includes discussions about Christians and Jesus in that. Uh, Lucian, uh, the Samus, I cannot pronounce it, Sama, Samosata. Sa Samosata, he lived between 125 and, and 180 AD, he was a Hellen, Hellenistic Syrian satirist. So basically he poked fun at everything in society. And obviously he wrote about Christians and about Jesus. Uh, the Acts of Pilate, which are also sometimes referred to as the Gospel of Nicodemus. This is not a, necessarily a Christian work. It's, a, it's, it's definitely not positive toward Christians, but they talk about Christians in here. We believe it was written somewhere in the mid second century. We have copies that date back to the fourth and fifth century, which is very, very ancient copies. Uh, we have Philagan of the Trellis, which uh, who knows, these, these names defeat my tongue, but he was a Greek writer. Uh, he was a freedman by Emperor Hadrian, and so he was a slave and he was freed by the emperor. And he d does what he calls the the Pelagian or Pelagian's Chronicles, which is just his life story. But in it, he talks about Jesus and the earthquakes and eclipses that happened around the the, the crucifixion, which is a, it's one of those outside Bible uh, stories that depict all those apocalyptic things that happened at the death of Jesus. And actually, his writings are mentioned by. Origin of Alexandria, who's an early church father. When he was writing about Jesus and Peter, he quoted this guy's extra biblical work. Uh, Mara the Serapinian. Now, Mara Bara Serapinian is a Syriac Stoic philosopher, and he refers to this wise king of the Jews, which we all know to be Jesus. And then we have the Jewish Talmud, 
which was developed somewhere in the first and second centuries, the, the version that we have today, and it obviously talks about Jesus. You have uh, Philney the Younger, which was a Roman, uh, he was some sort of a Roman official in northern Africa, and he was writing to Caesar to try to figure out how to handle the Christians. He had been persecuting the Christians, and we'll read a little excerpt from him so you can see kind of what he had to say about Christians. Uh, Suetonius, this is Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, who was another Roman historian in the first and second century. And he wrote biographies of the first 12 Caesars, and in those he talked about Jesus. And then there's writings from a couple of Roman emperors, which also m mention the tribe of Christians in a little bit of background. So these are all completely non-Christian sources, which corroborate the fact that Jesus was a real person and that he, he died. In fact, many of them talk about the crucifixion in their writings. But in addition to that, we have what I'll call pseudo-Christian and Christian writings from the same time period. You have things like the Gospel of Thomas, which is a Gnostic gospel. But obviously it talks about Jesus, and there are lots of Gnostic Gospels. Uh, we have something called the Apocryphon of John, which again talks about things around the crucifixion. Uh, the Trustees of the Resurrection, and these are all in that non-canonical writings that we talked about that happened sometime after Jesus. Uh, Gospel of Truth, uh, the Gospel of Barnabas, and that's just a few. Not to mention, we have lots and lots of letters from early church fathers like Ignatius and Polycarp and Justin Martyr and Quantrus and many others that obviously talk about Jesus and the crucifixion. But these are all historical evidence for the person of Jesus because it all happened within you know, 150 years or so of his death. That's way too fast for a legend to develop. And some of them are obviously contemporaries to Jesus himself. I've heard a lot about the Polycarp. I've heard a lot yeah. about the Polycarp dude. Yeah, Polycarp. Yeah. Uh, they, they refer to him as the Bishop of Smyrna. Of course, they didn't have bishops. That's, that's the Catholic Church that's putting that, that claim on things. But he was, he was an early follower of John the Apostle. And in fact, Ignatius, Polycarp, and uh, Irenaeus, I think, or Papias, I can never remember the order of, of the guys, studying under the Apostle John, and that's where they got their understanding. Uh, Polycarp is recognized as probably knowing most of the original apostles. So he's, he's a second-hand observer to, to Jesus' life, but very close second-hand observer. Um, his story is interesting because they tried to kill him by boiling him alive and he wouldn't die. He was singing. They ended up stabbing him to kill him. But uh, the early stories of, of, of these men are just, just amazing history. So I, what I wanted to do is kind of just take it a step further and let you guys see a little bit of these writings and what they actually said about Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, the first one is the Talmud which is very interesting because it says on the eve of Passover, Yeshua was hanged. We know he was hanged on a cross is what it means. But this is in the Jewish religious book. They're admitting that Jesus, Yeshua, was, was killed. I mean, there's no, there's no Jewish scholar that is considered legitimate that will deny that Jesus was killed by crucifixion. Because it says so in their most holy book, their Del Talmud. Also, we got Josephus. Now, Josephus, if you don't know the story of Josephus, it's interesting because he's considered a traitor by Jews. He's not a, a Jewish friend by any stretch of the imagination. He was, when, the, when they did the revolt against Rome, he got instilled as the governor of the Galilean region. And when Rome came to squish the rebellion, this is around 66, 67 AD, they captured Josephus. But instead of killing him, they kept him as a translator. And so he wrote the history of the Jews while he was in that position. So his perspective is not necessarily pro-Jewish, but it's definitely not pro-Christian. 
So it's a very interesting history because it's kind of from a third party where he has firsthand knowledge. He would have been alive when Jesus was alive. There's very good chance that he, he very good chance that he, he look in his book when you want to find out something that you can't find anywhere else because he in there. really does. And I mean, he has a lot of history. That about this time, there lived Jesus or Yeshua, a wise man, and indeed one ought to call him a man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. So Josephus himself is saying, this guy was different than other guys. For he wrought surprising feats. That means he did miracles. He was the Christ. So Josephus is claiming as a Jew, non-Christian, Jesus was the Christ. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, again, proof that he was crucified, and those that had come to love him did not give up their affection for him, even though he was crucified. And on the third day, he appeared restored to life, and the tribe of Christians has not disappeared. So this is Josephus admitting that Jesus was more than just a man, and the fact that he appeared to his disciples restored to life. Josephus doesn't even seem to challenge the resurrection, which is very interesting, considering he didn't become a Christian, but this is a third-party, non-Christian historical account. Uh, Lucian, the Christians who worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. So again, it's talking about Jesus. Very obviously, Christians and their leader was crucified. And it was impressed on them by their original lawgiver, that's Jesus, that they are all brothers from the moment they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws, which pretty much describes us as Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tacitus is another his, uh, Roman historian. So Nero fastened the guilt, this is talking about the burning of Rome, on the class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, this is a Jesus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. So that pretty much ties the Bible story together. And most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. So Tacitus is saying this, we killed the leader and the movement didn't stop. And it even came to Rome, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it's, just, it's just amazing. And then Pliny, the younger, uh, and he's writing to Caesar because he wants to know what to do with these Christians. And if you read more of the letter, he has tortured them. He has done all kinds of things to Christians, tried to get them to recant, and they won't recant. So he doesn't know what to do with them. So he's writing this letter to Caesar and said, they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as a God and bound themselves to a sol solemn oath not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver up on it. After which it was their custom to separate and then resemble to partake the f reassemble to partake of food, but food of ordinary and innocent kind, so not offered to idols is what he means. So he's confused. It's like, you know, they don't do anything bad. You know, this kind of sounds like Christians again. So those are just a couple, just little samples of non-Christian historical documents which are available to us still today, which talk about Jesus. And there are, there are a lot of them. Uh, um, to give you a contrast, I, I gave you 11 non-Christian sources from the first two centuries. Uh, not counting the pseudo-Christian and, and all those. There are 12 surviving sources that mention Ju Julius Caesar. There's 11 non-Christian sources that mention Jesus. There are only 10 surviving 
written sources for Augustus Caesar. There's 11 for Jesus. This is the obscure carpenter from Nazareth. If you add the, the additional pseudo-Christian writings and the Bible, you're, you're talking about 40 plus sources of Jesus in the first two centuries, which actually, if you summed up the first 12 Caesars, you probably would have more for Jesus than you did for all the Caesars. It's, it, it's, a, it's kind of a staggering historical account for Jesus. So people that want to deny the fact that Jesus was a real historical figure are ignoring the historical evidence. Uh, if we use the same standard that they want to use, we wouldn't be able to trust anything from history. Definitely, we wouldn't know. There's some Caesars that are only mentioned in one document. Okay, so did, are they real because they're only mentioned once? Well, probably. So I think it's really good evidence for the historical, this historical Jesus. Any, any questions? You guys are so quiet. All our, our mess ups with the sound is, has, has ca caused everything to kind of, but I, I think anytime someone wants to use the legend and the, the myth development over time, you need to ask them why they think that and then tell them that, you know, I, I can, I, we have access to more than 40 sources from the first two centuries after Jesus that support that Jesus was real and they are not Christian sources. They had no vested interest in telling us anything about Jesus. So to deny those sources is, is really to deny any historical document. So the, the idea that Jesus, myth or legend, is, is just ignoring the historical evidence. So we'll kind of move on from that one. The next is the deity claims. And this is one that's kind of had a big comeback in recent years. And I actually think the movie Dan Brown did, The Da Vinci Code, 